So let me set this up for you. For a while, there has been a civil war between the former king Saul and King David. And yet, while they have been fighting each other, they've also been fighting wars on other fronts with the Philistines and the Jebusites and the Moabites and others. And then at the Battle of Mount Gilboa, Saul fights the Philistines, and he is killed in battle, as well as Saul's son, Jonathan, also falls in battle. And Jonathan, Saul's son, just happens to be David's very best friend. So with Saul's death, essentially the civil war is over. David is the victor. And he goes around and he starts to defeat the enemies of Israel, the Philistines, the Moabites, the Jebusites, and he consolidates his power, unifies the kingdom, moves the capital to Jerusalem, and becomes the true king of Israel. But Jonathan is not the only progeny of Saul. There are others, other sons, that are around the countryside. They are scattered about. But some of David's allies, those who are within David's circle and sphere of influence, they decide that those progeny, those other male heirs, and in this case, in ancient Israel, it really is the male heirs that are somewhat of a threat to David's throne. David's allies, his, they decide that they are going to go around and assassinate Saul's other sons. And those who could be a rival to David's claim to the throne. And when the words of those assassinations get back to David, David is not happy, and he responds with a type of justice that is bloody. He literally strings them up by their feet, and he cuts off their heads, those who assassinated Saul's sons. And this leaves only one surviving male heir in the line of Saul, whose name we learned this morning, Mephibosheth. He is a special needs child who cannot walk because his feet have been crushed. He was born not a special needs child, but when while his grandfather Saul was fighting a battle, and the battle got too close to the tent that Mephibosheth was in, and he began to run. He was crushed underneath some battle armaments, and he could no longer walk on his own, and he became a cripple, as the scriptures tell us. So did you catch that? He was a healthy boy who became a special needs child due to being collateral damage to the violence Of his grandfather. But now he is alive and he is a threat in to David's claim to the throne. And if David was a student of uh, Thucydides or Machiavelli or Emperor, Emperor Palpatine or Mr. Burns or Circe Lannister, he would recognize that this young boy is a threat to his throne, his claim to the throne and kingdom, kingship of Israel, and he would do whatever he could to solidify his power and to remove this child as the political threat that he was, whether that be in imprisonment or exile or even worse, execution. And let's not gloss over the fact that David has this in him. If you think, just for a moment, that David doesn't have this in him, Two more chapters from now, what what Bob read in chapter 9 of 2 Samuel, two more chapters in chapter 11, we begin the whole sordid Bathsheba affair, where David basically kills another one of his best friends and one of his most trusted generals simply so that he can sleep with his best friend's wife. So David is not a saint. And yet, in this story he does something absolutely beautifully saintly. And I don't think we need to hear, and I don't know if we don't hear about the story more because the names are so hard to pronounce, or because it has so many layers, and the layers are so vast that it takes a good chunk of time just to unravel them. But for some reason, we don't hear this story ever in church. David chooses peace over power. 
He chooses reconciliation instead of judgment. He chooses to practice grace instead of what is politically advantageous to him. You can almost see a devil sitting on David's shoulder, whispering in his ear, get rid of the boy, get rid of the boy, telling him that this child is a threat and he'll only come back and betray David, which almost happens, by the way. But that's another story for another day. But David instead listens to the angelic voice on the other shoulder. He invites the boy, the son of his best friend who was killed in battle, to be part of David's royal court. He restores Saul's ancestral lands to the boy, Saul's grandson, his only living heir. He welcomes the boy into his family. That's what it means by saying that there is a place around the table for Mephibosheth in David's court. He becomes ostensibly part of David's family under David's protection, all because of David's just immense love for his friend Jonathan. And we know from the biblical records, you know those genealogies that many of us skip over when we get to those points? Well, part of the genealogies in the Old Testament shows us that Saul's line continues through Mephibosheth. He grows up to be an adult. He gets married. He has children. And those children have children. So David, by listening to the angelic voice of peace and reconciliation instead of the devilish uh, voice of power and political intrigue, not only saves this boy's life, but generations of life to come. David, in this instance, lives into what it means to be anointed by God. He doesn't always do so, but at least in this instance, David chooses the righteous path over what is politically advantageous and expedient. He values peace instead of exerting his power. He values reconciliation instead in standing in judgment of this boy. And let me tell you, as much as these words are easy to say, it is not easy to live that ethic out. Living into our better selves is not easy. Not with the temptation to control a situation by use of power and force. Life is a grind. There are lots of things that are chaotic in our world. And when we have an opportunity to use our power to control it to our benefit, we often decide to do so. And to make the point clear, let me tell you two more biblical stories which make this case. The first one is almost a mirror image of this David story. There's a young boy born in Bethlehem who is said to be the new king of Israel, a threat to the throne of Herod. And when Herod hears this news by Magi coming to Jerusalem, the king, Herod, decides not to invite the newborn to be part of his court and to sit at his table, but instead the king unleashes the military upon children born under the age of five, killing 2,000 to make sure that the one child who is a threat to his throne is eliminated. And the lure of power was an early challenge to Jesus' ministry. In the Gospel of Matthew, we are told that Jesus is transported to a high mountain and promise great authority over every kingdom on earth if he'll just bow down and worship Satan. There is a moment that is captured that shows the great tension between how hard it is to maintain our integrity and how to choose leadership over what is politically advantageous and how to practice authoritarianism. Unless we forget that this, this decision was effortless. We only need to remember that the ordeal of this temptation was so great that it left Jesus in need of angels' care. In the past, 
I have either preached or I have heard sermons on the famous temptation scene, and we often marvel at Jesus' willpower without ever considering the emotional and spiritual energy it takes for Jesus to retain his integrity. It is rarely, if ever, pointed out that the rejection of such power was so exhausting that Jesus needed the medical, psychological, and spiritual care of angels. So let's not think that any of this is easy. Modeling our lives after Jesus is hard. Practicing reconciliation instead of standing in in judgment of others is hard. It's easy to judge other people. It's hard to practice reconciliation. Valuing this life with the grind and the chaos and all the things that we have going on in it instead of standing and pining for the next world to come, which it sounds like such paradise, is hard. Not giving into the temptation to use our power and to seek glory and fame is hard. And it can take a great deal of emotional and spiritual strength to do so. Let me give you maybe an example that might bring this home of how hard it is not to give into temptation. I quit smoking 16 years ago. No, that's not right. 12 years ago. And every day since I quit, I have pined for a cigarette. Oh my God, I just want one so bad. (laughs) Every single day, I just, I want a cigarette so bad. And so three weeks ago, I'm watching a baseball game with a buddy at a bar. And we're watching the game, and he goes outside to smoke a cigarette, and he says, do you want one? And I was like, eh, what the heck? Yeah, give me one. And I smoked it. And every nerve ending in my body exploded into life. Oh my God, it felt so good. I loved every moment of smoking that cigarette. It was the best. It was the best. And every day since I have driven past a 7-Eleven, I have thought to myself, you know, one more cigarette probably won't kill me. (laughs) And I've had to drive past it because it felt so good and I felt so alive. And that is akin to when we use our power to the detriment of ourselves and others. We think it feels so good, but it has such negative ramifications. So we need to practice Practice, practice, practice. Yes, Alan Iverson, we need to practice. We need to practice what it means to live the ways of peace and reconciliation and not give in to that temptation. And we need community. We need friends to help us. We need friends who are there who will not judge us when we decide to smoke a cigarette, when we know we're not supposed to. And we need friends who will help us when we don't live into our best selves. Turning to Philip Gully in his book, If the Church Were Christian, he writes, churches should be, in a very real way, laboratories for peace, modeling the principles of reconciliation among ourselves, and then inviting and equipping the world to do the same. Do you hear that? What he's saying kind of goes back to that old classic hymn, let there be peace on earth, but let it begin with me. Or to invert the Taoist proverb, if you want peace in the universe, work for peace in the world. If you want peace in the world, work for peace in your country. If you want peace in your country, work for peace in your community. If you want peace in the community, work for peace in your families. If you want peace in your families, work on peace in your heart. The first step to practicing peace is putting yourself in the mirror and doing some self-reflection. It's not judging others. And that's hard. Because the temptation is to put the mirror down and to see the speck in everyone else's eyes when we can't even see the log that is within our own. Gully asserts that we need a safe place to work out how to live in peace and practice reconciliation and implement these attributes in a way of living our lives based on the life of Jesus. It starts here. 
And then it emanates out into the community and into the world. Now, out here, I know what some of you are going to say. I don't really have that much power to exert. But if we look at our lives, we will see, given any given context, we have more or less power. I have infinitely more power here as being senior minister of Kensington Community Church than I did when I was a student in seminary. But I had more power than some students because of my relationship with the dean and with other faculty members. I have more power now as an adult in my family than when I did when I was a child, and I have more power now than I do, than do my young nieces and nephews. I have power over my dogs, though they seem to control my life. So given enough time, you can probably come up with context that you have more or less power. And we all have personal agency, and we all have the ability, the capacity to seek out that power to control and manipulate a situation for our own selfish goals. Gully says, and he ponders, and I agree with him, Sometimes I wonder if religious institutions, because of their historic emphasis on rules and morality, are especially attractive to persons interested in power and control. We have been steeped in a pretty awfully depressing election cycle. And yet, election politics have nothing on church politics. I have worked on passionately and lost many elections. And in a couple of days, forgot all about it. But I have, I have scars, as I bet some of you do, from battles that are waged inside a church. And it leaves me weary and wary and the, being the walking wounded. Office politics... Any of you have ever sat on a parent association for a school? Ever been your, your union's representative for a labor union you belong to? Family politics? The same applies. So the church needs to echo what David said to Mephi Boseth. Do not be afraid. I will show you kindness. It needs to employ what Christ taught his disciples that the Sabbath was made, that the man was not made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath was made for man. Meaning that this day, this time, gathered together in this beloved community is a gift to us to set aside, to get out of our culture, which puts so much emphasis on fame and power and wealth and status, to come into this place and practice the ethic of love. For Christ tells us that we ought to love one another as he has loved us. So if the church were Christian, it would value promoting peace over exerting power. It would practice reconciliation instead of standing in judgment. And it would say to you, do not be afraid, for we will show you kindness as we are gathered in a community to practice the ethic of Christ's love for us all. Now, I have said very little up to this point about the general election. I have taken the course that Sunday mornings ought to be a respite from all of that. But I need to address one thing. There's a guy, a priest, at a church called the Immaculate Conception Catholic Church, who said and put a flyer in the bulletin that said, if you vote for Hillary Clinton, you will go to hell. So let me make a very clear point, just in case we are in a position where we might actually believe that. I'm going to tell you everything that Jesus said about who to vote for. 
That's all of it. <laughs> Let me tell you what's going to happen on Wednesday morning. There's going to be either a Republican or a Democrat in the White House. There's either go the Republicans are either going to control both, one or neither of the houses of the House of Representatives or the Senate, and the same thing with the Democrats. There still is only going to be eight Supreme Court justices, and you're going to wake up, you're going to put one foot in front of the other, and you're going to try to make the best out of your life. Now, what to do with this guy? Let me tell you. It is tempting to say the man is an idiot and to say that shame on him for exerting his power to intimidate and make others fear fearful. fearful. So we will not judge him, though we will not condone what he did. Instead, we're going to take an opportunity to practice the ethic of Christ, to echo the words of David. Father such and such of Immaculate Conception Catholic Church, do not be afraid. We will show you kindness. You are still our brother in Christ, though you're acting like an idiot. <laughs> for around this table is a place for us all, regardless of who we vote for or our political beliefs, whether we're male or female, slave or free, Jew or Greek. This is a table of peace. This is a table of love. It is a table of reconciliation. And there is a welcome extended to you all. So we gather today as they gathered nearly 2,000 years ago. And we take bread as he took bread and we bless it as he blessed it. We break it as he broke it, and we share it as he shared it, saying, this is Christ's body, broken for you. And likewise, we take the cup as he took the cup. Again, we bless it and give thanks for it as he did as well. And we pass it among each other, saying, take, drink, for this is the new cup, this is the cup of the new everlasting covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And each time that you gather around this table and you eat this bread and you drink this cup, remember what he taught us, how he lived his life, and how much he loved us, and that that love never comes to an end. In a moment, you will be invited to participate in this meal by taking first a piece of bread as it is passed to you and eating it and then taking a cup and drinking it. Now, will those who please are going to serve our communion meal please come down at this time.